And good morning, and I'd like to welcome everyone to the November third Thursday marketing meeting. Uh, we have a special guest uh, today, Jeff Dorn from Planalytics. Jeff and I have worked together for about ten years in various projects and things, and he is a fabulous meteorologist. And he's going to give us all the correct answers that we want to know about the weather going forward. No pressure. Okay. All right. Well, thanks so much. I'm going to uh, share my screen here. And hopefully everybody can see that okay. All right. So, again, thank you so much. Really appreciate uh, the opportunity to, uh, to speak with you today. Let me bring my screen up so we can get a big picture here. All right. There we go. And again, uh, I'm Jeff Dorn, uh, Director of Specialized Support and Services at, at Planalytics, and really happy to be uh, uh, presenting our uh, our weather outlook for the Americas. Uh, let's take a look at what we're going to be talking about today. I do want to take a couple minutes on the front end to talk a little bit more about Planalytics, uh, what we do uh, in the industry, but more importantly, you know, what we're doing for AgriSampo and other uh, similar clients. So we'll take a few minutes on the front end to do that. Uh, but then I'm just going to launch right into it, uh, bring everybody up to speed on all things weather, um, kind of talk about um, kind of where we've been, uh, drought, look at drought, soil, moisture, not too much to talk about with snow. Um, definitely have to talk about some low river levels that are going to be a bit concerning uh, as we head further into the season, uh, and a little bit about greenness as well. Uh, again, we do provide uh, greenness information. Uh, that's the basis for uh, the, for the crop yield forecast. I'll talk about that, and then we'll build the story, right? Um, looking at the oceans, what's happening there, how that's influencing the atmosphere, the things that we're going to be looking at. Uh, that's going to be kind of driving the uh, uh, season, um, you know, through the winter season. Thinking about the the wheat and other uh, the winter crops. Uh, we'll take a look at some short term and some longer term forecasts. It's going to take us through uh, the bulk of the winter time. And then I definitely want to uh, address South America. We'll take a pretty comprehensive look at South America, really just getting their uh, their season started down there. Uh, so we've we've got some challenges uh, that we need to talk about there. So um, there will be an opportunity at the end of the briefing uh, to ask any and all questions. So I'll be happy to to do that. Um, just very quickly, uh, again, we are a weather analytics company. We're the market leaders. In the global supply chain, uh, we work in a lot of different sectors. Actually, the biggest part of our business uh, is in the retail and supplier space. Um, you can see some of those uh, industries that we work with, but certainly in the services, um, you know, I support pretty much all of the service areas, uh, agribusiness, finance, energy. Uh, so, again, it's all about providing information that our clients can find actionable. In terms of our agribusiness clients, this is kind of how it breaks out. Um, we have about uh, 15 clients in these various uh, uh, segments, if you will. And certainly AgriSampo is uh, uh, very pleased to uh, have, have gotten you as a formal client this year. And uh, I will just say that we're now at the point where you know we're looking to extend that relationship into 2024 and beyond. So again, it's been a great partnership and uh, we want to continue that going forward. Um, this is just a, a very high level view of all the different things that we're doing to support you. Um, again, we're, we're looking at uh, daily reports, weekly reports, monthly reports. Uh, they focus on weather, but they also focus on all things agribusiness. Talked about the, uh, you know, the fact that we work with uh, Terametrics Agriculture out of the University of Kansas uh, that provides us NDBI uh, satellite based greenness information. That we then use as the basis for the crop yield forecasting um, that we've been providing you uh, this year. So we'll take a, a look at that. And again, just some specialized reports around planting, around harvest. We look at things like severe weather, snow and ice. So it's a very comprehensive service. So just a very quick look at some of the key, uh, key areas here. Again, it's really about these crop yield forecasts um, that we know are used extensively. I work very closely with Drew Remington and Trent, Trent Nows to uh, provide this information. Um, we provide this crop yield for winter wheat, uh, for corn, soybeans, and five other summer crops uh, through the season. Uh, this report comes out uh, every other week. Um, and so uh, we've been providing that. Uh, that runs from uh, basically March through September. Uh, we also provide county level information for corn and soybeans. So this is just a depiction of what these county level forecasts look like. So it, 
not only does it provide you the expected uh, county level yields, uh, the departure from trend, but it also provides a very uh, robust spreadsheet uh, that, that, again, we provide uh, four of these uh, in season. Uh, and then we have what we call the, the Monday morning roundtable. Uh, Drew and Trent join us. Uh, Sterling is, is always a, a strong contributor um, to, to our Monday morning briefing and uh, appreciate all of his insights. And again, it's an opportunity for us and our clients uh, to get together and talk about weather and more importantly, how weather impacts uh, their various businesses. So there's a lot of great insights that are shared. And, and certainly if there are more folks that are interested uh, in Acrosampo to join us, certainly welcome to do that. Um, and then, you know, every month we provide what we call our seasonal outlook. And that's basically what I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna segue right into. Uh, it's that we do this every month for our clients, basically providing the latest uh, and how we think weather is going to impact all things agriculture. So that's it. That's uh, just a hopefully a very brief assessment of uh, kind of what we do in the agribusiness space and more importantly, what we're doing for AgriSampo. So I now want to kind of launch into the uh, the guts of the briefing. So let's let's take a look at the U.S. first. Um, again, it's all about El Nino right now. Uh, I'll have some more comments to make here in a few minutes, but no doubt that El Nino is going to be the most significant weather impact that we're going to be dealing with through the winter time, uh, and frankly, into the spring and possibly into the summer as well. So I'll show you some uh, some things about El Nino. As we look back, uh, it's been a fairly warm harvest season, um, particularly across the plains and the western Corn Belt. Um, we have you know, accelerated maturity and harvest progress through a lot of these uh, the, the key growing areas. Uh, and the fact that we had a later than normal freeze also helped as well. So uh, harvest went along pretty, pretty smoothly as a function of, uh, of weather. Uh, the eastern Corn Belt, uh, they've been behind though with uh, with cooler temperatures, but the freeze held off and they were able to get uh, to get their their crops out fairly well. Uh, cooler weather in the northwest quadrant. Uh, so again, we had a pretty warm harvest season, but we did get that cold blast in late October and early November. And that's kind of what we're going to be looking at here. Uh, in terms of precipitation, we actually had a good month uh, in October for much of uh, much of the northern states to include the plains and corn belt. Got a good deal of moisture, and I'll show you evidence that that did improve uh, the drought conditions that that uh, had been very concerning through much of the season. Um, we got some snow across the northern Rockies, North Dakota. Uh, even Texas, Oklahoma benefited from uh, some eastern Pacific hurricanes that kind of brought moisture into the region. So a lot of areas got got some definite improvement. I know Brooks talked about southern Illinois and some of those areas that uh, are are getting missed. Uh, but overall, it's been uh, it's been a better scenario for a lot of folks. It has been dry though across the southwest, and particularly in the southeast. I heard there's uh, some folks uh, in from the Carolinas. They're probably feeling uh, some of those drier conditions. Uh, setting in, but uh, we'll certainly have some news about that. And hurricane season, we're, we're pretty much uh, at the very end of that. We didn't really see any significant activity um, that really moved the needle in a lot of ways. Okay, so let's kind of dig in a little bit more. This is looking at the uh, root zone soil moisture. And when we're talking about root zone, this is the top meter of soil is, is how the root zone is defined. And what you're looking at here is kind of the, the percentile of soil moisture in the last 60 years. Um, you know, the, the legend indicates uh, anything that's um, surplus would be in blue, shades of blue. So that would be across parts of Texas, Oklahoma. Uh, parts of the South are now looking better than they have in terms of soil moisture. Uh, the Northwest Quadrant is looking pretty good. The, the far Northeast is looking good. but the concerns are where you're seeing the oranges and the reds, right? And we're still holding on to a lot of dryness across a good part of the, the central plains there, Nebraska, um, Kansas, Iowa, Missouri, right there in the heart of the Western Corn Belt. We're still dealing with some pretty considerable moisture deficits, even despite some of the improvement that, uh, that we've seen. So this is a, the drought monitor that's basically hot off the presses this morning. And you can still see quite a bit of drought there, right in those very dry areas that I showed you. And um, very, still very droughty across the Southeast. It, again, that whole Southeast quadrant has been very dry for the most part over the last several weeks. They did get some recent rains here, but as you can see here, they need a lot more uh, to really kind of uh, get, get, 
get them on the right side. So looking at uh, the change in the drought, I mentioned before that we saw a decent month of rainfall across uh, parts of the Corn Belt. Now, not everybody got it. You can see there are some pockets there. Uh, Brooks alluded to Southern Illinois. That's an area that's got missed. <laughs> uh, southern, southern Iowa, southeastern Nebraska, but a lot of areas did see that improvement. But take a look at that southeast quadrant there uh, in, in Mid-South and Carolinas, uh, very dry. It could certainly use a lot more moisture to combat that growing drought. Not much to talk about right now with snow cover. Um, snow, the actual snow cover is uh, really relegated to the high elevations of the Rockies. And we did get some snow a couple of weeks ago across the far north, but that's since melted. Uh, again, everything is looking below normal at this point. I'm going to talk about it in a little bit, but we got some changes coming. Uh, some much colder changes that are going to improve the chances for snowfall. But let's turn our attention to something different. Um, uh, low Mississippi River water levels. And it seems like this time every year we're having some sort of issues. We certainly saw that the last couple of years, and uh, we're seeing that again. So that area that I've highlighted uh, along the lower Mississippi and those brown dots um, translate into these very low water levels. Uh, you can see these various uh, uh, sites that I've pulled up here. So they did see some rain across some of these areas, but uh, you know a relatively dry forecast coming up is going to is going to push those levels again to um, ones that could be unnavigable. Uh, so it, this is going to be a continuing story for us to watch. Uh, spoiler alert: there is some good news in the forecast here, but it could be uh, just something we're going to have to continue to watch as we head through the uh, through the winter uh, season. Okay, and then uh, finally, before we get into it, uh, just looking at the greenness. And again, this is uh, uh, via our partners at Terrametrics Agriculture out of the University of Kansas, applied remote sensing. Looking at uh, and, and the fact that we have over 20 years worth of this NDVI greenness data allows us to do these comparisons. So on the left hand side, you see the comparison to last year. So compared to last year, we're actually uh, looking pretty good with some of the, uh, uh, the early wheat development here. Particularly across parts of uh, Missouri, Oklahoma, and and across the north, where they've had more precipitation across the Dakotas, um, they're probably just starting to get the the wheat uh, emerged out there. So we're starting to see some good signs there. Compared to normal, a little bit different. We're st we're seeing more patchy greenness, if you will, across the uh, the hard red wheat areas. Um, definitely some drier um, spots that have contributed to less greenness. Compared to what we would expect, particularly from Kansas, Western Oklahoma, and down through Texas. So, look, it's it's a scenario that we're going to have to continue to watch uh, as we head further into the winter. Okay, so that kind of gets us up to speed with all the things that we're going to be looking at as we head through the season. Now, I want to start to build the story a little bit here, and for us, it really starts in the oceans. So, what I'm showing you here is an animated sea surface temperature anomaly chart. So, where you're seeing the the Oranges and reds represent warmer temperatures, uh, where you're seeing the shades of blue represent cooler temperatures. By far, the, the biggest thing of note here is uh, across the equatorial Pacific in that box uh, here in, uh, in this box right here. This, this is the signature of the strong El Nino that uh, has continued. This is an animated loop over the last 30 days. So you can see this El Nino is, is firmly in place. A lot of warm sea surface temperatures uh, globally, for sure. The other thing of note here that we boxed is this area of very cool water. Um, this is uh, basically what we call a positive Indian Ocean dipole. Um, and I will tell you that it has significance as we think about the downstream effects from this particular trend. Before we get away from that, uh, I do want to show you that um, you know, there's this area of cool water down here across South America, and particularly out here that's kind of gaining. Uh, in intensity, this cooler than normal water down in over south, uh, southeastern Brazil and Argentina. This is actually good news because it supports low pressure in the atmosphere and it has been the source of basically a, a very unsettled, very wet pattern for uh, for that area down there. So um, there's, there's definitely uh, evidence of why why we're seeing that. This is a, a depiction of the last 30 days in the upper levels. Um, this is kind of a snapshot, if you will, of looking at atmospheric heights. So the thing to take away here is that we've got uh, a fairly highly amplified pattern with um, high pressure in the upper atmosphere out across the west. 
it's been supporting these uh, these shots of cold air that we've been seeing, uh, and one that's going to be coming in for next week that looks very impressive, and then basically just settles into uh, to the east before moving out. So in a lot of ways, it is transitional, but it is this is a pattern that will support those those shots of uh, wintry conditions as we head forward. Okay, just now a quick focus on El Nino. This is looking at the probabilities that uh, that uh, what we call the ENSO, and the reds indicate the El Nino, as I mentioned in the opening, 100% <laughs> probability, and you certainly saw by those sea surface temperatures that uh, we're going to be an El Nino uh, trend pretty much for the remainder of the winter into the spring. Uh, there will be some decline in that probability, but, you know, we know historically that the ENSO is typically the strongest in the wintertime anyway, so, um, you know, the, the Confidence tends to wane a little bit as we get into the spring season, but again, it is at least for the foreseeable future, El Nino is, is going to be locked in. And so when we think of El Nino and kind of a typical El Nino, and, and let me tell you, you know, they've seen a lot of these uh, ENSO cycles, not all El Ninos are exactly the same, right? Uh, but when you think of a typical trend, and what we're showing you here is what you can expect from a kind of a typical average El Nino scenario. So on the left-hand side, you're seeing the, the temperature anomalies. So where you're seeing the oranges and reds represent warmer than normal temperatures, where you're seeing shades of green and blue represent cooler than normal temperatures. Uh, precipitation on the right-hand side shows those drier areas, typically across the northern regions, uh, across the, the northwest quadrant, if you will, and then uh, in parts of the eastern corn belt. But, but if realized, great news for areas to the south, from Texas all the way into the Carolinas, uh, El Nino seasons tend to be uh, pretty cool, pretty wet as well for these areas. So a lot of the region that's been dealing with some significant drought conditions over the last uh, uh, several weeks, um, certainly from a trend perspective, it looks like they could be do doing better. So again, this is a snapshot. I'll actually provide you the, the, the outlook here shortly. So when we think about the major factors, I pretty much described them here. It's really going to be El Nino is going to be the primary base state. So I just kind of showed you what that tends to look like. Uh, and you can see that here in, in the text. But also this idea of this positive Indian Ocean dipole uh, and how it impacts what we call the Madden-Julian oscillation, uh, which is kind of this idea of, of forcing, kind of more of a localized forcing and the downstream impacts that we see. So they they tend to be competing factors. So when we, you know, when we think about El Nino, it's the warmer, drier north, it's the cooler, wetter south. When we think about the influence from the MJO uh, this year in this particular orientation, it's gonna be more around um, it's going to be more around uh, cooler temperatures coming into the west and then supporting a better chance for uh, for storms in the plains uh, and, and the southeastern and then plains and the northeastern U.S. So you can see that down here. So there's depending on which of these factors is predominant in any period of time. And again, we think that both of these will be. Uh, we're going to see, you know, the potential for some varying factors here. Suffice it to say that you know, the winter ahead is going to be fairly typical in terms of, you know, periods of cooler weather, uh, uh, cooler and warmer weather, wetter and drier weather. It's just going to be where is that going to be at any particular time? So you can see that there. All right. So let's, now that we've kind of looked at the overall factors, let's take a look at what the outlook looks like. So this is looking at the next 14 days. So you know, you're averaging over a 14 day period, so you can kind of get lost in the trends. But when we look at the next 14 days, temperature on the left hand side, it is going to trend cooler than normal uh, across most of those key areas of the plains and, and corn belt into, into parts of the, the uh, southern plains as well. Um, that's the minimum temperatures. So we're basically looking at minimum temperatures, not straying too far from typical, which are going to be in the 20s and 30s, with teens across the north. <clears throat> and, um, you know, 30s and 40s across the south. But take a look at the maximum temperatures, uh, looking to be considerably cooler than normal uh, in the 40s and, and even into the 50s. But it's really going to be a function of how things are, are looking this week versus next week. 
So this week, we're still going to be looking at generally moderate conditions, generally warmer than typical in a lot of areas. But next week, we are looking at a really strong blast of cold air uh, that's really dictating what this two week period looks like. So um, think of that, that cold blast we had in the late part of October, early November. This could easily be as cold, if not colder, uh, as we head into the back part of November. So uh, snow, or excuse me, uh, precipitation and snow for the next seven days. Uh, looks like we're going to see some good moisture across parts of the uh, parts of the east, particularly the, uh, the the east coast. There, not so much in the plains. Uh, we we are seeing some seeing some traversing systems in the in the west. It's going to start to build some snowpack, so that's going to be great news. Uh, but snow is going to be fairly limited for the upcoming week, um, just because it's going to be generally warmer. But take a look at uh, week two. And again, not a lot in terms of the amount of moisture that we're looking at, but but certainly we're looking at a higher potential for snow to start to be uh, more expansive uh, across the northwestern quadrant and then down across uh, parts of the, the Great Lakes region. Uh, we could definitely see some measurable snow across portions of the Corn Belt as well. So looks like we're going to get winter up and running here pretty quickly as we head into uh, into the very back part of November. That takes us to uh our monthly outlooks starting in december and so these are based off of uh you know a lot of the el nino analogs that uh, we we looked at before um, it's looking generally a snapshot warmer than typical across a lot of the country uh, if we had to make any adjustments to what this temperature might look like probably shading a little bit cooler than what's represented uh, across the southeast and across parts of the southwest but there in the, uh, in the heart, the heartland and the plains and much of the Western Corn Belt, I think we could expect that's, that's a good call expecting near normal temperatures, but it's going to be, it's going to be characterized by some pretty, uh, pretty significant cool downs and some, some warm ups. So it's going to be a transitional month as we think about uh, that temperature pattern. But I think uh, the precipitation pattern definitely looks spot on. Um, based on our knowledge of what uh, you know, the factors that we're looking at right now, and that is increased moisture across that southeast quadrant into the east coast. We're going to see uh, quite a bit of storminess uh, enter California, and then parts of the west. We're going to start to build that snowpack uh, pretty significantly. You know, El Nino years tend to be fairly wet in uh, in California. I mean, there are exceptions. I mean, last year we had an incredible winter in California with the La Nina. So again, not not all of them perform the same way, but certainly El Nino years can be ones that can that can bring a lot of moisture to uh, to much of the West. So we're feeling pretty good about where this lies in terms of you know moisture into the plains and some of those key areas of the you know the some of the wheat areas there. There will be some moisture, and particularly um, if if we get the uh, the MJO to be more of that stronger factor, that tends to support more of the uh, storms in the plains. So it doesn't look like a disastrous winter right now, the way things are looking at, uh, as winters can be sometimes. As we head into January, things are going to start cooling down a little bit, starting to look more El Nino-like. Again, it looks like more of the warmer anomalies across the, the northern areas. It is trending a bit warmer across the plains, but I think overall we could expect much of the U.S. to average pretty close to normal, and again, characterized by those, um, uh, those strong temperature variations. Uh, those those warm ups and cool downs, uh, but again, precipitation more storminess for the west. So for anyone with interest in California in the west, we're definitely seeing um, another winter that could shape up to be pretty pretty good. And then we're seeing some above normal above normal moisture continuing in the in the southeast and into the into the northeast and kind of near normal for the plains. Uh, we've got some drier areas that could be expected, but overall, I think uh, precipitation could be adequate. And then finally, uh, in February, it's actually shaping up uh, to be a, a little bit better there in February. We could see uh, quite a uh, setup for uh, some significant wintry weather, some winter storm, putting down some good snows across parts of the plains. You can see kind of some indications of that uh, with that green shading. Uh, more moisture for the uh, the southeast. I will tell you also for anybody with interest on the east coast, El Nino seasons can tend winters can tend to be ones that support some some strong nor'easters that could bring some snow to uh, to parts of the uh, the east. So that's something certainly to uh, uh, to watch as well.
Uh, drought, looking at the NOAA drought outlook, they're pretty pretty bullish on uh, on some drought relief here. So look, there have been spots that have, that have been missed, but uh, overall, they're it, it, and I'm feeling very confident about this idea of some drought uh, alleviation across the south. Uh, that'll be great news there. Across the north, relatively drier, although they are looking for some drought relief. I think we're in overall agreement. There could be some further relief, but there could be some times during this period where we could be uh, trending a bit drier. Okay, so uh, let's get right to South America. Uh, again, this is kind of their their key. Uh, this is the start to their to their growing season. So let's take a look back first. This is looking at what we call our season to date temperature on the left, precipitation on the right, and this really speaks to the scenario that we're in. And, and that is that uh, while Argentina is south, southeastern Brazil and Argentina, after a drier start, have really been the recipient of this uh, very widespread and, and heavy moisture over the last several weeks, can't be um, further from the truth for much of Brazil to include you know, the key growing areas of Mato Grosso and into parts of the, uh, the Northeast. Where it's been very hot, been very dry. We've seen temperatures trending, you know, well into the 90s. Uh, even some spot 100s um, are, are starting to become uh, more prevalent here. So it, again, it really is a tale of, of, of two different trends: Brazil hot and dry, Argentina cooler and wetter. And how that's translated into again, we're looking at the root zone soil moisture for the continent. And where you see those shadings of blue represents where it's been quite wet. And typically you would think it's always good to get moisture, although I've talking to Sterling uh, here earlier, and he's certainly seen reports um, uh, of some replanting that's been done across uh, Rio Grande do Sul and, and some of those uh, some of those areas in far southeast Brazil. And that's extended into some of the northeast cotton areas of Argentina as well. But boy, when you look uh, any across much of Brazil and, and you know central and western Argentina, uh, we're really mired in a very, very dry situation. We also do greenness for um, not only for the US, but also for South America. And uh, this is looking at Brazil. There's three profiles here. Um, on the left hand side is versus uh, the last week. Uh, the middle is versus last year. And on the right hand side is, is versus uh, versus normal. So again, parts of uh, southern Brazil are in much better shape from a greenness perspective. So uh, again, you know, those relatively cooler and wetter conditions have certainly helped with the greenness trends. But, you know, if you take a look much further north to include Mato Grosso, uh, it's the greenness is depicting a pretty, uh, pretty significant dry situation that's impacted anything green. You can see how that kind of extends into some of those northeast states as well. And this is look at Argentina. If I had showed you this just two weeks ago, this would have been a lot more brown uh, because Argentina actually did have a pretty dry early start to. Uh, their planting season. I mean, they're still kind of in that late planting window, but they've been very dry coming into it. And with all the moisture they've seen here in the last month or so, uh, things have really improved pretty considerably. You can see a lot more greenness, particularly compared to last year. And that does include kind of that key growing state of Buenos Aires uh, versus normal. We could still use more precipitation, um, but uh, those far eastern areas are still looking looking pretty good. So I would just say the way the trends are looking is that uh, after kind of the disastrous season they had uh, last year, Argentina is is definitely looking at a much better scenario uh, ahead. And we'll see that in the short range outlook here. This is looking at the next 14 days. And, and pretty much the trend is going to continue to support those, those, you know, hotter and drier conditions for some of those key uh, states of Brazil to include Mato Grosso. But we are, again, looking for that stream of moisture to continue to come into northeastern Argentina uh, southeastern Brazil to uh, continue to keep those moisture profiles pretty high and uh, temperatures are generally going to be more moderate. So, so that's uh, looking pretty good. I mean, certainly for those areas with excessive wetness, uh, you know, that that could be something to, to watch as well. Now, this is looking at weeks 3 and 4 and the trends support more of the same. Uh, again, more precip uh, higher precipitation in those areas that have already gotten a lot and we could really use more moisture to the north, but the longer term trends are not really supporting it. And I will tell you that historically El Nino years have been not been good to Brazil. 
pretty typical looking El Nino signature. And we would need some major things to, to happen uh, to kind of break down what looks to be a, a pretty difficult pattern for Brazil. And this is just a snapshot of what the summer could look like. Um, and it should be no surprises here based on the way the trends are looking. So again, it looks like more hot and dry weather for much of Brazil, near normal temperatures and, and weather for Argentina. So it really represents a flip of what we saw last year. And uh, you know, last year we were in a La Nina trend. This year we're in an El Nino trend and it uh, yeah, spells some difficult, uh, difficult situation for Brazil. It's not completely dry. Let me let me just be clear on that. But in terms of you know what is fairly typical, uh, we would expect a, a drier than normal trend for most of the most of the country. And finally, I just want to want to make a little bit of a plug for um, not only what we're doing on the greenness in South America, but uh, we also are doing soybean yield forecasting as well uh, for both Brazil and Argentina. Um, we, this is, I think, actually the fourth year that we're going to be doing this. Uh, we do uh, again Terrametrics, our partnership with Terrametrics. They are uh, producing these forecasts. Um, currently, our relationship does not include the South America forecast. But if there's any interest, uh, certainly as we're talking about uh, continuing to work with you in 2024 and beyond, uh, we'd be really happy to to speak to them. Okay, that was a lot of information to present and. Um, I'm going to open it up to questions. I give give it back to Sterling or Brooks. I'll turn it back to you guys. Jeff, I've had a few questions come across via text. That's a lot of a lot of folks don't like to use the chat button. But okay. if you could go back a couple of slides, I think this will preface this question. And it's uh, in relationship to Safrina corn acres, uh, the double crop corn behind the beans. Um, how does the map correlate? Is there anything basically the question is, is there any um, any inferences we can have to the weather's effect today on that planting? Has, has it already been backed up because of bean planting being backed up? Uh, any effects of weather today that we could look at uh, what happens to corn? Yeah, so what is the time period on the Safrina? Just to, just to um, refresh my memory. Um, typically, typically planting in late February. Uh, early March, right through that time period. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, it's going to be south of the I, I, south of the Cerrados uh, area. Is you know it's that Rio Grande do Sol up to Cerrados is kind of that key area. Okay. Right. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, look, if current trends hold, um, I think we probably need to be concerned about um, some delays. Um, you know, as we transition out of this very wet looking pattern. Um, I could certainly see if this if this continues, things could be pushed back. I mean, we're already hearing about this replanting and, and delays. So if we just kind of extend that thinking out, um, you know, that that could extend uh, could extend the season, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I'm just kind of I looking think at right what, now, Jeff, we're looking for anything, uh, any source of optimism we can have on corn. <laughs> and so, uh, right, right. you know, we uh, we're looking at, a, you know, uh, the um, the meeting between uh, administrations in China and U.S. is a, is a positive sign, but doesn't look like it's going to yield any fruit until maybe the second quarter. Mm -hmm. uh, we see this back up in in Safrina plantings potentially. Um, in Brazil, and uh, then I think, you know, we're going to be looking at a battle in corn acres. So a few things out there we had, I had that question come across too, is more directed to Sterling and I about corn acreage, but there are a few things on the horizon that. That could give us some optimism after such a long time of lower prices The the 2nd question we had is. We really benefited um, from US soybean meal sales over the last six months because of such a poor performance in Argentina last year. And particularly our beans in the US were in great demand in August and really through September 20th. And if you happen to be close to a processing plant on the river, so think in Cairo, Illinois, Mount Vernon, Indiana, Owensboro, Kentucky, kind of the quickest ones to the Gulf. Um, what kind of impact does positive Argentine weather, you know, have on on that? And, and it's a it's a really good question. It was asked for, uh, by someone from Mississippi, and um, 
you know, Jeff, I don't know what your thoughts are, but I think it could take down those early premiums that we saw a little bit for early delivery last year. Will that weather hold up in Argentina? I think so. I, I, I'm, you know, again, it really looks like this trend is is really robust. We're not seeing any anything globally um, that's really going to disrupt this this pattern. You know, this this ENSO trend. South America is is definitely one of the more consistent performers in terms of how El Niños and La Niñas um, impact them. And and as you've seen here, it, it typically Brazil and Argentina are completely different animals. So depending on which trend you're in. So the way things are shaping up right now, if we're talking anything Argentina, I think we're pretty bullish on, on uh, what yields could be this year. Uh, so how that kind of impacts, um, you know, imports and all of that, that's kind of above my pay grade. But, you know, the other thing that we'll have to watch if we're talking about, um, you know, getting transport is, um, we think that the Mississippi River situation right now doesn't look great, but it has the, the chance to improve. So, um, right. so I think that's also a factor that, that kind of could be helpful here as, as we think about that question. Right? Yeah, no, I, I think that's legitimate. You know, demand is, is fairly poor when it comes to corn. Uh, it is poor uh, in the Gulf. And so, you know, we haven't had that big demand on the river system. It's probably a good thing because with barge counts down over the last five years, um, drafts um, continue to be limited on a daily basis. Uh, it would be tough if we had that robust market that we had three years ago to get corn to the Gulf. And then I look at your your forecasted slides out there for a a drier Iowa, Nebraska, I guess I should say Missouri River Valley which is, you know, supplies a lot of water in, Missis in upper Mississippi as well. we got to kind of keep our eye on that, I think, over even as early as March to see how that affects things in the fall because it can have a big bearing on how much farmers put in their pocket. No, that's a, that's a great point. And, yeah, we'll have to watch that close because, again, winters can be kind of dry up, up across the northern reaches of the uh, river system. So that, that, that could be a developing story as we head further into the winter. Sterling, any comments on the uh, on the meal demand in, in Argentina's, you know, what looks like to be a, a better start there? That is, I know that's more in your category. Well, they may be off to a better start. That doesn't guarantee that their exports are going to be as strong as uh, generally expected. We have seen, noticeably, and today included a big uptick in export sales for soybeans coming out of the United States. We had our best day really since 2012 for export sales for soybeans uh, today. Now, if China takes those, that will be good, and that will alleviate some of our crush a little bit, and we won't be as reliant upon those meal exports. Now, will the customers come back and buy those Argentinian meal supplies when they become accustomed to the U.S. supplies? That's the real question. And if we can continue to see some moderation in the dollar, we may not be as affected by those as we think, as Argentina might find themselves not crushing quite as much meal or maybe not being able to sell it due to the actual quality of the meal itself. So we'll see how it goes. If it gets cheap enough, yes, we'll have a problem. If it doesn't get as cheap, then I think we may see some potential. Argentina may be moving more beans in our meal uh, exports won't be as affected uh, as one might think. Jeff, you mentioned some South American forecasting on potential yields down there, and um, I may be off on my calculations. I haven't got a calculator right in front of me, and we're dealing with metric tons, but I believe that Brazilian crop estimated somewhere around 5.93 billion bushels in that neighborhood. Have we started to take that down yet, or are we um, are we waiting to to lower those types of numbers? So, uh, so Brooks, we we have not actually started our South American yield forecasting for this coming season. All right. So that that's something that we typically our first one typically comes out the first week of December. So I can't really I can't really speak to uh, any of the All right. Trends. That, I mean, that, was, that uh, was an old slide. Yeah, another question, and, and I'll I'll throw a little bit of information towards that question since it came in via text, okay. and uh, 
I want you to think about how tight the soybean supply is, okay? When I mention 5.9 billion bushels of production, um, if we cut that nominally, I, I'm talking I'm talking 100 million bushels, which is a lot of beans, but not a high percentage of what could be lost in, in Brazil and South America. Think about this, if demand stays static, which it looks pretty good, looks pretty solid, we're at 245 million on our carryout. So just to refresh everybody from the WASI numbers last week, that's 245 million bushels left over in our bucket at the end of August going into our new crop year. If demand stays as robust as it is, if we're 100 million short, uh, in theory, those beans come out of the United States, uh, takes us down to somewhere around 150 million. Um, Sterling, if that's the number that's printed over the next six months, how does that impact not only soybeans, uh, but perhaps all protein um, you know, numbers here in the US? If we were able to boost our exports by 90 million tons, which would take us down to 150, uh, a 150 carryout would correspond to, right now soybeans are 13.59, that would put about $1.70 back into those beans, depending on volatility, depending on the dollar and other factors. We could figure that might be able to put, it's gonna help the corn, okay? But we don't have any worries globally about corn supplies right now. That might be good for 40 to 60 cents in the corn. Again, kind of depending on how things shake out. And so, you know, as I, I got a text from Jason on here that said the cash price in Northern North Dakota right now, $3.86 on corn. Yeah, and you know, if you add fifty to seventy cents to that, it's still not very good. I mean, compared to where we were at over the last three years, yeah. and, and this is something that we've really, really preached, Sterling, over the last few marketing meetings is, folks, we can't look at a flat price or even a futures level and say, I really want to achieve X for my corn. It's fine to do that, but you may be disappointed. Instead, Sterling, what we've talked about is choose the right environments to be sellers. Tell us a little bit about what we've kind of harped on the last few few meetings. Well, here, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna switch over here. and I'm gonna share a picture of the price of soybeans right now, because we might as well, we're going to anyway. So this is current chart of soybeans. And as you can see, we get flares up and we drain. And yesterday we challenged $14 and we have made a rather bearish pattern as prices have backed off again today. What I strongly recommend is paying attention. That's the first thing. This isn't something where I'd like to get $14.50 for my soybeans. That may or may not happen. We're very early in the growing season. It's suddenly Brazil is normally a very wet place. It gets moist again. We're very early pretty good chance this crop will come back. Right now, Conab's at 162 million tons, which corresponds to that 5.9 number that Brooks has. It's too early to start shaving it too much. If they can shave it a little bit, that's we're gonna see some outsized responses. But again, watch for pops in the market. If you look down here, when we start to see this RSI touch the red, that's a sign that we're beginning to get overdone on a relative basis. Those are probably your best chances to either to sell some cash, sell some futures, buy some puts, however, whatever instrument you want to do. But we need to be attuned to this because prices slump back pretty easily and pretty quickly. If we move on to corn, you saw how, you know, the beans have done better. Well, corn has done a little bit better at times. But if you notice here, we had our nice little pop here and we're right back, right back here in the, uh, right back here in the soup. And it looks like we can hold 460 a bushel, but we'll see. There's a problem, a bigger problem, and I'm going to switch to that right now. And yes, I'm going to say that the problem, one of the problems with the commodity space is this stuff. This is crude oil. And as you can see, it's getting battered again today. There are a lot of not speculative CTA aggressive trading funds. There are a lot of passive commodity funds that buy a broad basket of commodities. The biggest chunk of those baskets are made up of this stuff, made up of crude oil. When crude oil has a problem, that can spread to every other market. And 
that's something that we're going to have to contend with and that's going to make our bounces aren't going to be as healthy and our declines may be a little more sudden and a little more severe not unlike what we're seeing in the soybeans today and as far as the situation with crude oil we're going to show you that here real quick three charts this white line is u.s domestic crude production we are back to the 2019 peak these charts this is supplies this is demand okay demand is falling off a table that's a worry production is going up yes we're going to have better prices at the pump may not be for the best reasons we want so if we can get this to change a little bit that's something that can help the overall grain picture and also the soybean oil is a big component of the crush now not like it used to be oil share oil share is a completely different thing so if we start to see bean oil prices pressure that will pressure crush that in turn will pressure the soybeans so again it's about paying attention when you see an opportunity don't be thinking that we're going to be in a raging bull market here unless you know in six weeks if the weather's still the same in brazil then 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 we can talk about something different and seeing that 100 million bushels or maybe even two or 300 million come off and that will change things but for now this is where we are uh jeff i've got one i've got two questions that have come across here uh very quickly i, I want to follow up on sterling's um thoughts there he, he touched on rsi the strength index and and that one's an easy one to watch okay when it's there he also talked about the speculative buyers or sellers taking a basket of commodities so Sterling on Fridays, you do a really good job of talking about where those specs were at. And just to kind of put it in simple terms, when someone from the outside wants to put money into your market, that's whenever it's our job to take it. So read those Friday updates. Those are really good in the daily market email. Jeff, this okay. next one's for you. And I'm going to hustle through these because we're coming close to the end of the hour. Uh, okay. Four months, Jeff. If you had four months that you felt like were going to be the most volatile out of the next 10 in the marketing season, uh, what would they be? Well, I mean, if you just based on at, weather, I, I, I should have prefaced yeah. that. The, the question was based on weather. It's it's pretty easy from a climatological perspective, and, and that is typically the spring weather is most volatile. I mean, that's when you're going to get the most changeable weather in terms of temperatures. I mean, look, March, April, May, they can be fabulous, right? I mean, think of 2012. I mean, when, when we just had an amazing planting season, uh, of course, then, of course, that turned into a disaster as we all, as we all know, but, but, you know, we're, that's a time when we talk about severe weather, we, we're still talking about snow. Um, I just look at those those shoulder seasons, right? Is the spring and the fall are typically the most volatile. If that's that's what you're looking. That's when you can get the most differences in terms of weather's impact. Right. Good answer, Sterling. I'll, I'll switch that question around. This wasn't asked, but I'll, I'll I'll ask a variation of that in regards to commodity volatility. Uh, Jeff did a great job answering that on weather volatility, commodity price volatility. Uh, what's your four? Uh, my four are right when South America really gets going, which is actually now December, January, and into February, because the planting area in Brazil is big and it's a lot different. And then we also have our typical volatility that we see, you know, we can get it with planting if there's a planting problem, or, you know, obviously we get out into our uh, June, July, August, if we start to get some weather. And again, a lot of this volatility is weather dependent. Some of it is currency dependent. So again, we have a lot more factors because we're looking at a much bigger global market. And Brazil, they're producing 5.9 billion tons of soybeans. How much do we produce here, Brooks? Uh, a little over four. A little over four. So, you know, Brazil has become the 800 pound gorilla. And they are also gonna produce an enormous amount of corn as well. So we, we are, we are changing from the way things were 15 years ago and changing noticeably. And, and I'll give everybody notice a couple more minutes on questions if you're shooting me text um, or use the chat box. But um, here's one. It's ironic, Sterling, you mentioned currency dependency. 
current currency dependency. It sounds like a, that's a weird combination of words, but on the farm, we are very dependent on capital during this time of the year. And the question is, if you must have money on the farm before the end of the year, you know, which commodity do you take to town? And, and I'm going to take a stab at that. Sterling, I want you to add color to this answer or disagree or agree if you want to. But here's the way I look at this in practical terms. In most places where we had solid yields, um, $14 cash, $13.50 to $14.50 cash, wherever you may be in the market, will come very, very close to profitable numbers. And in most places, it will be profitable. If you go to the I states where, where yields were really strong, I think you have to take those to market. And, and having said that, I think you have to hope you're dead wrong. I, have, I think you have to hope that prices go to $16 or that buck 50, buck 70, like Sterling was alluding to. You have to hope so because nobody has any corn sold. Uh, I know that that's an exaggeration, but there's very little corn sold, even of what was hauled in the harvest. And hope that beans drag this corn price up to where you can get 50, 60, 70 cents higher. And again, I think if we set our sights on X dollars for our corn, whether that's six, six fifty, maybe even five fifty, um, we we could be disappointed. I think you really have to look at those indicators in the market to tell you when to sell. So my vote is if I got to have cash, I want to make sure that I have a profitable commodity. I can afford to be half wrong. Um, if if Brazil gets the rains, and that five point nine turns into five point nine five even. 5.96, the downside for beans is, is substantial. Downside for corn may be somewhat limited. I would take my chance with these 1350 to 1450 beans. And, and I'm sorry for the folks in North Dakota. I know you're not in that price window quite yet, but for the majority of our viewers, that's where cash prices are, are landing right about now. Sterling, your take on it? I would agree. The potential for volatility is far, far higher in the soybeans. Everybody knows how much corn we've got. We've got plenty of it. No one's in a big hurry to buy it. And that's not going to change anytime soon. Okay. That's just how it is. And corn seems to have a bit of a natural floor. Gasoline prices coming down might help a little bit more driving. We'll see so far that hasn't been the case. The lack of driving is driving the gasoline prices down. So I don't think we can get much help out of ethanol. Now, we saw 3 million, 3, 3 million metric tons of soybeans sold this week, mostly to China. If we can have a Brazilian weather problem, if we can see China increase their hog herd, noticeably, which they need to do, Mr. Z is all making peace because things are not good there. They have a huge unemployment problem that they're going to have to deal with. So far, our export sales of corn to China have been dismal to non-existent. Sterling, I want to I want to jump change. in. I want to jump in real quick and highlight something that you've said for the last 2 years because I think it's really important based on those comments. And it is that China's economy does not work like ours. Yes, there is a supply and demand factor there. But Sterling just mentioned something. Um when there is the potential for unrest, when the populace is unhappy in China, we start to feed the populace better in China. Mm -hmm. And um, we're starting to see signs of that right now. We go back to 2020, back to January 2020, and if Sterling was to analyze export, U.S. exports of corn to China, it would be a very quick discussion because there were none. And suddenly, um, about March, April, May, June, we saw significant changes. You hear me say this in meetings a lot, but we were building COVID hospitals. Sterling, what else were we building in China about that same time? Oh, we were building uh, high-rise pig processing uh, units. That was the biggest thing here. But I'm going to show you accumulated soybean exports to China. Actually, okay. Actually, that's soybeans. I don't want that chart. Hold on here. Corn Accumulated corn to China. And this will show things over the last five years. This picture is worth 
a thousand words. This is our accumulated exports of corn to China. Right here is where we are for this year. This little red line right down here, which is a whole lot, not much. Now we go over here and we look at our previous years. Things are noticeably different during the COVID period. We had all of this. This is normal down here, meaning not much goes to China. Now, if they want to expand their hog herd, the government will shove and decide what you want to do, but they're going to want to drive those prices down. Maybe, maybe we could see some corn exports going into China. Yeah, good points. Well, guys, we're we're 56 minutes in. Um, any closing, Jeff, I, uh, information just phenomenal. And uh, I think that uh, the number of questions that we've had uh, speaks to how good the information is, and we love having you on here. Uh, so we really appreciate your input. Any final thoughts, Jeff Sterling, uh, to close this thing out? Jeff, you first. Yeah, just first of all, again, thank you so much for uh, for, for having me here. Uh, again, we really enjoy our partnership with you, and we really look forward to continuing that. Um, you know, just we're we're always looking at the weather. You know, Sterling is a weekly uh, attendee and a contributor, and so you know all the reporting and everything. We're certainly going to keep everybody posted. We know Brazil and Argentina are of huge interest right now. It's something that we are going to be looking at uh, very closely. And through our weekly discussions with Sterling, we're certainly going to keep him updated. So again, thank you so much for for having me today. One thing I would like to point out is watch out for volatility in the currency. The dollar plunged on our weaker than expected CPI report. That weaker than expected CPI report was, they missed each number was softer by one tenth. That is the minimum, the smallest amount, and we got a much oversized response. The yield curve is still messed up and deeply inverted. And we are think I think we are starting today Entering a period where bad news is going to, in fact, be bad news. So we could see a lot more currency volatility going on. And I also just booked my vacation going into Europe. So you can expect the euro to go screamingly north. <laughs> right Certainly, now. I got to ask one, one final question on that. You've done a lot of research on CPI and interest rates. Interest rates play a, a big role in whether you're operating an agency or whether you're operating a farm. We've got both agents and farmers on here. Any thoughts on that CPI number and interest rates? Well, the overnight rate remains at five, uh, 537 to 550. The 10 year right now is at 440. That is not normal. Now, the yield curve is going to go back to normal, meaning the 10 year is going to be trading above the overnight rate. This will happen one of two ways. Either the overnight over either the 10 year goes up and climbs like we saw through September and October, or Mr. Powell has to come in here and cut interest rates, most likely because there's an economic slowdown. We've seen a steady but slow a slow but steady increase in weekly jobless claims now for about 13 weeks in a row. And that would indicate that there's some economic slowdown coming. Along with that, the gasoline demand numbers. So is he going to come in here and cut rates? It may be like uh, energy prices going down. It may not be for good reasons, but again, data has been uneven. My inclination is to think that rates will move back higher, creating you know, a bigger problem down the road. So again, this is completely different from anything. The yield curve should have normalized by now, and it hasn't. So, again, this is unlike anything we've seen. So, interest rates, they're down, but they're still elevated. For mortgages and things like that, maybe we've seen the peak, maybe not. It, it again, depends on, on how the data flows and if we can avoid any upticks in any sort of inflation, which right now seems to be under control. But as we saw in the 70s, when it got back out of control again, it was a bigger problem than it was the first time around. So a couple of, couple of last thoughts. I got a couple uh, texts in here, just uh, some information looking at 10% operating lines for 2024 on the farm was one comment I got. Autumn, I see your question in the chat. That was 5.93 billion uh, CONAB production. 
and versus 4.1 and change uh, US production. So that kind of give you an idea. I think we can expect that US production to be a little higher next year, but that would be uh, kind of last year's production on beans versus our forecasted production down south. I'd love to sit here for a long time and, and answer questions and have dialogue, but I know everybody has got to get to work. So uh, Sterling, Jeff, thanks so much. Uh, Ashley, behind the scenes, thanks for making this work. And thanks for everybody for listening to this month's marketing meeting. And everyone have a great Thanksgiving. Thank you all. Take care. Thank you very much. Bye now. Thank you.